for the latest episode in our Celebrating Entrepreneur um, series with uh, Hatch Ventures. Now, those of you who have watched previous programs will realize that um, normally I normally interview uh, one of the entrepreneurs behind the companies that Hatch invests in, and we've seen some really kind of interesting ones to date, and we will see some others in the future. Uh, but today we're doing something different. We're interviewing somebody different. Um, he's not currently an entrepreneur, but the great thing about my guest today is he's been an entrepreneur, he's been part of a startup, He's been part of a venture capital firm and now is an investment associate at Hatch Ventures. So I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, Jeremy Luzinda. Uh, Jeremy, goodness me, I'll get your name out there. That's uh, <laughs> the old teeth into place. Have a swig of the tea. But really nice to see you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, so I say you've got a lot of strings to your bow. You've done a lot of things kind of all, already. Let's kind of start where I normally start with uh, their, our interviewees. Um, but, you know, a bit of your background and really kind of kind of uh, when and why did you get involved in being an entrepreneur to start with? Sure. Well, firstly, Lawrence, thanks a lot for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I also binge watched the other videos, so hoping I can live up to the others that you've had on the, on the, uh, on Celebrating Entrepreneurs. To your question, so, you know, when and, and why did I become an entrepreneur? It sort of depends how you define entrepreneur. So I think I have that typical story of selling things in school, right? So sell sweets in school. Um, what I would say was a bit different though about what I did was, um, so think about a playground, right? In a playground, you have groups of friends and like, where you've got different people in the playground selling sweets, the first set of customers are always going to be you know, your friends, right? Your friendship group. But I sort of understood that and, worked out that if I could get other people selling for me within my year group, but from different friendship groups, um, instead of me having to compete with another person, um, also selling sweets and trying to sell to their group of friends, maybe I could empower them by sort of buying all the stock, giving it to them before school, they would sell it to their friendship groups. And that way, I'd probably, I was sort of growing via channel sales, as you would call it now, but back then I didn't know. And that kind of grew. So I still, I got other people in another year group selling for me as well. And um, I never saved any of the cash, unfortunately, but it, it was it was a great experience. One of my friends managed to save all his cash. And to this day, he used it as seed money for one of his businesses. That business is now doing a million pounds in ARR. He left his role at Google and he's he's flying now. So one of my regrets, but it was it was a great experience. In terms of why I became an entrepreneur, though, it's a, it's a tough question, really. Um, so my dad started his own accountancy firm. And I guess it's that saying, like father, like father, like son, right? I sort of wanted to impress my dad. And my dad was someone that, dad is someone that loves business. And so I think for me, the natural thing for me to do was play football because he loved football, but then also sort of start a business, start, start doing things to make money. And I love the idea of creating value, making my own money, buying things I wanted. Um, I didn't really get much pocket money growing up. So I sort of use the money that I was making from selling stuff to you know, buy the latest clothes, buy the latest games. I'd go to a Wendy market and buy, you know, knockoff Hollister polo tops and Adidas jumpers and then sell those at school and you know, tell a white lie about how I have you know, friends, family friends who own um, a store and how it's gear they couldn't shift they, they, they're asking me to shift it and I was just looking for you know, different ways to make money and I, and I loved it and then that sort of led on to a career of entrepreneurship and then now being a VC investor. So that's a great story so I think it's kind of fair to say this sort of entrepreneurship is is almost in your genes isn't it if you sort of inherited it from from your sort of father and, and I think you know one of the common things that we kind of hear from from our entrepreneurs the ones that Hatch are invested in that they often have started young and I think selling things in the sort of playground has been you know is is something that uh, a lot of people seem to get into kind of very early now I know what you know one of the first experiences that you kind of had as kind of being part of kind of what it was a sort of startup um an exciting business. It was one that the the Gates Foundation, so Bill Gates, sort of uh, kind of backed. So the um, the Shore Chill Company. So, kind of, how do you get from selling sweets in the playgrounds as a youngster, uh, going to Wembley Market in North London? For those who don't know, which is kind of there's quite a lot of um, uh, not entirely authentic gear there, but it's a good <laughs> price. So I absolutely uh, get where you're coming from. To to you know to kind of working for a business 
being part of a business that was backed by, you know, somebody like Bill Gates. Story. Wow. Um, so, look, I, I sort of did my A-levels, went to university. While at university, I realized that I knew how to put suits together. So I, I mentioned before that when I was selling suits in school, I'd use that money to buy clothes. Now, I was I'd probably brand myself as a man of style. I like to dress well back in the day. Not so much now, as you can see. <laughs> But um, I used to I used to like dressing well, and um, in sixth form we had to wear suits in sixth form, and I didn't really have a lot of money. So what I would do is go and buy separate, so individual garments. So maybe a, a blazer from one place, a trou- a pair of trousers from somewhere else, and a shirt from somewhere else. I'd buy them cheap um, on sale, and I sort of had to work out how to put them together because, well, you had to look good, right? So by doing that over the course of two years, I sort of realized how to put individual pieces together well. So a stylist would call it color coordination and sort of making something look good. But I realized I could do it quite well and on a pretty good budget. So while at university, um, I thought, well, look, people like what I wear and people actually a lot of the time think that what I wear is much more expensive than it actually is. Well, what if I could buy individual pieces from different retailers, put it together and sell the entire outfit? but obviously at a, a much higher markup. And so I found this suit, um, these individual pieces, put it together. Um, the whole thing cost me about maybe like 80, 90 pounds, but I sold it for 300 pounds. And I sold about 20 of those, created a website, got some models from university. I found a barber shop um, close to where my church was. I sort of told them, hey, would you mind if I took some shots inside of your barber shop in exchange for um, photos that we would take of your barbershop and you could put those on your Facebook page. They obliged. So anyway, I ended up selling um, these suits and made a bit of money from it. And then I thought, well, actually I can, I can do this. I can create a business out of this. Um, and I went on and raised about a hundred grand. Um, I was going to drop out of university. Uh, my parents um, unfortunately were um, against the idea and they told me to crack home with school. So I sort of, Part of the idea, I had the cash in the bank, finished a bit, finished university, graduated. Um, but then I sort of lost momentum and I didn't know what I wanted to do after university, but I sort of knew that I didn't want to go down the whole banking route. Um, long story short, I ended up joining a, a small suits company called Charles Tirrett, right? And the idea was, was look, Jeremy, if you can work retail and understand a problem, like a deeper problem, right? Not just creating outfits made up of individual bits and just making money but an actual problem that you can go out and solve with this cash you now have and so i worked at charles Tirrett on the ground on the shop floor you know, doing five days six day shifts if i could because i was trying to pick up as many hours as possible just to find the problem right and they they give you this onboarding gear and it sort of breaks down the business of charles Tirrett. and i remember just studying that and highlighting it um and then i realized that well Charles Tirrett makes all their money from shirts. That's the core of their business. And then you've got the adjacent markets where you've got suits and ties and whatever. But anyway, I thought, okay, great. I understand this market. Now, what am I going to, what, what am I going to do next? I still haven't worked out a problem. And there was this business called The Drop who were doing something very similar to what I wanted to do. And so I ended up turning up to the office, demanded a meeting with the CEO. He ended up offering me a COO position. And I joined there. We went on and raised about a million pounds from Ford Partners, The Garage, Soho, um, Founders Factory, a few angel investors. Um, Did that for about 18 months. Really, really interesting experience because you can only imagine just graduating from uni to now being chief operating officer. I've got a customer service team that I'm managing. We've got a logistics network across three continents. We're trying to service our customers. Um, Meeting with um, Sir, um, Sir John Hegarty, founder of BBH. I was meeting with him every two weeks for brand council meetings, speaking with Tom Teichman, you know, first investor in lastminute.com and made.com and on the highstreet.com. Brilliant experience. But then we couldn't get the metrics to get to Series A. And at that point, um, sort of the business started dying down. And then I got really interested in tech across Africa. And the investors at that company, The Drop, thought that I did a brilliant job. And um, when I said that I wanted to um, go and build something across Africa, at this point, I'd handed in my notice at the drop. I'd served my six months notice period. And now, and now I was ready to just sort of move over somewhere on the continent. The garage Soho had just put 
you know, five million pounds into this energy company out of nowhere. And they were looking to expand across Africa. And so Sir John Hegarty um, emailed the CEO and was like, hey, I think you should speak to this guy. You're looking for a managing director. Um, I spoke with the CEO and he ended up offering me a, an MD position, managing their expansion across Africa. And that's how I ended up at, at Shaw Shaw. Wow. What a story. What a story. And for those who, you know, sort of have not heard of um, the short show, yeah, there's a nice little kind of video online. I think when 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 the, the, the company was uh, featured on the one program on sort of BBC One. And for those of you who don't go and look, it's a, it's a it's a brilliant idea, which kind of keeps vaccines cool in kind of uh, far flung places such as parts of Africa where there isn't access to electricity. And I think we all know the sort of. Um, you know, the problems with keeping vaccines in a kind of good condition, particularly as we're kind of living through the pandemic. So, so Jeremy, over the sort of course of, 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 of that kind of period in your life, um, you know, you had some successes and you had some, some disappointments. I think that's probably the uh, reasonable way of sort of describing it. Um, we all kind of learn from these experiences. What did, what did you take out, out of them and how did that sort of feed into kind of what you did after the sort of the short chill company? Um, our failures <laughs> you learn a lot right you really do learn a lot from them and they're painful but I do think that they're they're a requisite of growth um so at the drop I mean not not raising enough not sort of getting the metrics to get to series a was painful right because I think what was most painful about that experience was I just graduated and you're sort of high on life right you'll see it you're, you're a COO you've I was what 2021 20, and I thought this is going to be a business we're going to build this to be worth a billion pounds and I put my entire life into it and I'm a bit of a workaholic so you know, Monday to Sunday um late evenings most of it to going out and sort of drinking and the business didn't work right it, and it was painful really really painful now one of the lessons that came out of that experience I think the first one was probably this, this whole idea of just listening to customers. So we, we were essentially creating um, on-demand clothing, right? So imagine, Lawrence, you, you find a suit on Instagram or social media and you think it looks great and you'd like to have that suit recreated, but you'd like it to fit you perfectly. And so you'd send us this picture and we'd make the suit for you. Now, about 80% of our business was coming from users that needed suits for their weddings. But we had investors at the time who sort of didn't want to, they didn't want to invest in a seasonal business. They wanted a business that could sort of work throughout the year. And so they were pushing us to expand into work, into the work market, right? Suits for work. But it just, it just never stuck, right? And we were getting a lot of pull from the market for weddings. And until this day, you know, I remember telling the CEO and sort of the CTO at the time, look, guys, this is, this, is, this is what the market's telling us at once. You know, why not look at expanding to a different geography in the winter months where maybe in the UK, you know, the wedding market isn't as big, but maybe looking at the States or somewhere else where in the winter, you know, weddings are a thing, right? Instead of trying to create an entirely new market where there isn't organic, pull, pull um, already there. And, and because we were trying to sort of service suits for work and suits for weddings, we never really had a core focus. And going from the drop to go into Shortchill, I sort of realized that, and it was the same problem at Shortchill, it was this idea of focus, you know, who's your customer? Um, you know, what's our business model? What do we do and what don't we do? And being very, very strict about that. Um, it's definitely something that I look for now in companies that, you know, we look to invest in, right? It's so easy at the earlier stages to sort of want to be all things to, to every customer, because when you're early, you just want to get revenue through the door and get traction, right? But it's very, very important to be focused. Um, I think that's one of the main things. I mean, there are, there are like smaller things that you learn just from sort of being in that sort of position of, of building a business, Um for example, if I had to name some, I'd probably say, um, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head, um, just, just general things like, um, I don't know, uh, you know, knowing which investors to bring on, which investors not to bring on, knowing the type of funding you want to bring into the, your business and at what stage, 
um, knowing your key metrics and defining those as well. I mean, that's so important. Um, I mean, when I when I joined Shortchill, I don't think at the time we sort of knew what our OKRs were, right? At, at, also at the drop, we didn't know what our OKRs were. I sort of had to enforce that because you know there will be so many things that are wrong with the business, so many things that need to be improved, so many support tickets that will be raised, but you sort of need to prioritize which support tickets should be work on, which ones shouldn't be work on which problems would be nice to solve versus do we need to solve, right? And that sort of comes, you sort of work out which ones you need to prioritize based off of those OKRs, right? Yeah, those are interesting things. Sorry, just to butt in there. And this is, you know, we're going to come on and talk about one or two of the companies that uh, Hatch has invested in and that you sort of play, play an active role in. But these are the kind of things just so um, the audience is kind of kind of realizes that you know for you as an experienced entrepreneur investor, these are the kind of this is the kind of knowledge that you're trying to bring to some of the businesses that Hatch is invested in at the moment. Of course, um, I mean, a lot of the founders that, that come to us, um, some of them, for example, may have massive domain experience but don't have exposure to really being at the earliest stages of a startup in particular, a, technolo a technology startup, right, which sort of has to grow at a fast pace. And that dictates, right, how you, how you, you know, the decisions you make and how you operate entirely, right? You know, being in an early stage technology company, you need to sort of have an open mind, you need to iterate, you need to test, you need to speak to users often. You need to be open-minded. You sort of need to work from first principles as well. So, you know, don't go into something with your with your with your own definition for how things should be, but instead be open-minded and listen to the market. Right? Those are all things that I think definitely, you know, I, I support founders with. I mean, even some small things like, you know, we had one we have one portfolio company that um, maybe had they they had you know a couple of things, a couple of issues with the product, right? And from a founder's perspective, you want everything about your product to be perfect. And rightly so, right? It's your baby. You've invested so much time and sweat equity into it. But not every problem requires solving today. Right? You need to think about what's consequential, right? And what's really, really important to the next stage of growth. And giving founders that perspective from my own personal experience, saying, look, this, I agree, is a problem, but it doesn't need to be solved today. Let's raise a support ticket, let's put it to the side and let's focus on this bigger problem, right? Which is going to help move things further a lot more by the time you get to, you know, for, your, for your next stage of funding or for your next stage of growth. Now, as I said at the outset, you kind of um, had a stint at uh, a venture capitalist, a uh, venture capital firm rather, sort of play fair. What um, kind of, what did you do there and perhaps Again, what do you kind of learn that so that you kind of, you know, again, beginning to share with some of the, uh, the Hatch Investee companies? Wow. Yeah, Playfair was a uh, trial by fire um, variant <laughs> for sure. Um, very, very interesting because um, although my career has been quite short, I've sort of been a founder and then been a director at this company. Short show, we'd raised about 10 million pounds at that point. Um, we had about 50 people at the team in the team, which is probably bigger than most of our portfolio companies. Um, and then to join Playfair and sit on the other side of the table um, as an investor, right? Now, Playfair is very different to Hatch. Um, so Playfair, you've got you know, a really strong investment team. You've got um, you know, Playfair have, have a great portfolio. But what's sort of different about Playfair is that Playfair doesn't have... Um, investors that have you know built and sold their own their own businesses before which i think is something that's very different to hatch it's very unique to hatch right so at playfair a lot of my role was sourcing companies supporting portfolio companies building relationships with other investors because i mean deal flow will come organically so people will put in um, applications send us their decks they want our investment, but equally, there are also other investors that need to syndicate deals. Seldom do you know one fund take up the entire um, fundraising round. And so they'll often need to syndicate. And when they are looking for people to syndicate, or funds to syndicate with, you know, they'll go to that fund that 
is top of mind for whatever reason. And, and part of my role was also making sure that we were top of mind for um, a lot of those top deals. So speaking with those investors, building good relationships with them. Um, and that, that, was, that was largely my role. I mean, we supporting portfolio companies, um, particularly on the product side as well, just given my experience um, building a consumer business, um, helping them strategize um, growth in particular. So looking at you know, what, what their CPAs are, whether those unit economics are sustainable in the long term or not, what we need to work on, looking at the different channels of growth as well. Um, the different ways that we can harness those growth channels, doing you know, deep dives into those for our portfolio companies and with their founders. Um, that, was, that was largely my role. So sourcing, um, sort of supporting the portfolio, um, and also just building our, our reputation. And that kind of naturally brings us to kind of Hatch. And I think you've partly answered my next question, which is kind of what attracted you to Hatch. And I think really from what you were saying, it's the... It's the element that uh, the partners at Hatch have all, you know, uh, all have been and, and actually are, you know, successful entrepreneurs. They've kind of done it from the ground up in the way that you did experience things in the early part of your career. Exactly, exactly. I think what you're seeing at the moment across the UK, even across the States, is that you're seeing a lot more cash in the market. Um, particularly in the UK, I mean, just two weeks ago, there was a, a company in the Times called Dispatch, um, A16Z led their 10 million pound round. I mean, what's A16Z doing in the UK? They're a silicon, they're a you know, Silicon Valley based fund. What are they? What are they doing here? What are they? What are they doing le leading a 10 million pound raise? You know, in London, right? There's so much cash in the market, and for those top founders, they can get money from from anywhere. I mean, these days you can go and you can do like revenue based financing where you sort of don't even need to dilute yourself to, to raise cash. But what's most important now because of that is value add, right? What founders are looking for are VCs that can support them practically. Now, what does practical support look like from a VC for a founder? Now, at the earliest stage, firstly, it's going to be strategy. Now, and this is where I think my, my value sort of comes in. Having been at Playfair, Let's take our SEIS fund. You know, we're investing at pre-seed. Playfair normally comes in at seed, and other funds like Playfair come in at seed. So, having been at Playfair, and I, mean, I probably worked on, I probably saw about maybe about three thousand companies in my time at Playfair. It was quite aggressive. You know, I've sort of refined um, my own process, right? I sort of because I've been that person at the next stage, that sourcing companies and looking at what looking at the companies that we should be investing in, I sort of have an understanding of what the companies at the pre-seed stage should have to really excite those funds at the next stage. So that, that's sort of the value that I bring, but at Hatch, I mean, you take Scott, you know, Scott's built and sold two businesses. You take Simon, he's built and sold his digital marketing agency. He understands growth like the back of his hand. You take Mark that has had extensive experience. I mean, he's, you know, what was VP at Google, you know, head of hardware partnerships across APAC. He understands B2B growth at the back of his hand, channel sales, pricing, commercialization. I mean, that's invaluable. You take Fred as well that understands product has been with Scott through Kitty Care and through Elevate. You've got partners that actually understand how to build businesses, that sort of understand how to make decisions as well when you've got so many options in front of you that have been through that strategic acquisition process as well a number of times. Um, it's valuable to founders. You've got so many founders as well, and um, particularly up north that don't really have exposure to um, mentors, right? People that have been there that can sort of expand their mind. And that comes with, with Scott and with Mark and with, with Fred and with, with Simon. Lovely. Well, well done. You passed your first test of uh, your uh, early period at Hatch. You remember the names of all the important people. So that's, <laughs> well done. Good start. Um, but kind of more seriously, I know, um, obviously, um, kind of issues that a lot of people are interested in, in deal flow. So how, how does deal flow sort of come through? I mean, obviously, you know, you expect you explained your experience at uh, Playfair, sort of, you know, seeing maybe two or three thousand companies, which is an extraordinary number. I can't even get my head around that. For a firm like Hatch, which is you know smaller in size currently, how do you, how does deal flow kind of come to to you all? And then perhaps talk about one or two of the businesses that you you know you've you've been involved with in the last few months since you joined the company. 
course. So in terms of deals, I think it's fair to say that Hatch is, is reaching this stage in the market now where you know, we, we've sort of done really well with our EIS fund and we've partnered with great company, with great funds, right? And because of that, I think we're developing a pretty good relationship in the market where founders now are reaching out to us. Quite a lot of founders are reaching out to us now and, and looking to partner with us for those reasons because, we, because we've had experience as founders ourselves, as operators ourselves, because we've, you know, we've backed great companies like Tate, you know, Tate, Take a Buy Me, for example, and Buy Me are doing wonderful. They're out now for their Series B. Take, take Marvel, for example, they're, they're past their Series B stage. We've supported companies. We've, we've proven that we can support companies really early and those companies can go off and, and be successful and raise subsequent rounds of funding from top tier funds. And because of that, we're getting a lot of companies, a lot of founders coming to us and, 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 and asking to partner with us, which is fantastic. We've also got our... We've also got our own network within the fund. So, you know, the portfolio now is about 20 strong and you've got those founders who have, you know, relationships with other early stage founders that are looking for funds to partner with. And they're doing a lot of the work for us now where they're, they're speaking to their friends and they're suggesting hatch to us, to, to, their, to, their, to their friends. And then you've also got the business network as well. Um, you've got the partners, like I said, that have sort of built a ton of relationships um, through their exits, through their careers. And you know, they've got a ton of relationships with angels, for example. Now let's take the SEIS fund. A lot of the time we're partnering with angels. Now, if an angel comes in, they may put a 50K check down or a 20K check down, but they still need to, to fill out the rest of the round. And so you know, who, who, better, who better to go to than a fund that can sort of co-invest of angels, but also has that experience and also that bandwidth to follow on and support portfolio companies with cash, but also with expertise. And so we're getting a lot of angels that are referring those to us. And then also personally for my own network as well with other investors sort of that I've built up, built up at Playfair, but also while at Hatch, I mentioned before that when, when funds go in on deals, they need to syndicate and Having built a relation, having built a network with relationships with you know, top tier um, in investors at top tier funds, right? Um, they're looking at us now because we've invested with top tier funds before. We've proven that we can support, that we can follow on, that we can offer practical value to our portfolio. And so they're looking at us and saying, "Hey, you know, can you guys come in and fill out the rest of this round?" And you know, we're, we're happy to do that. Lovely. Now, I know one of the businesses you've personally been involved with that uh, Hatch has invested in is, is called Diode. Uh, kind of what does it do? And I know I think I'm right in saying you kind of sit on the board as the kind of Hatch representative as, a, as an investor. So, yeah, tell us a bit about Diode. And then yeah, as, a, as a board member of Diode, what, 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 what are you kind of doing? Sure. So what's great about Diode actually is so we have an open pitch us form on the website where we encourage founders to reach out to us. So we're massively accessible. And that was something that I was keen to introduce from the moment I joined. So Diode actually came to us organically. They reached out to us through the Open Pitch Us form. Um, and they were the first company to have gone through the entire process that we, and we invested in them. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, so Diode, so they're in the electric vehicle space. So at the moment, um, you've got, entire fleets that are transitioning to electric vehicles from petrol and diesel, partly inspired by or motivated by um, the government's mandate that all new vehicles by 2030 have to be electric. Now what Dio do is essentially their web-based software that works with vehicle leasing partners to assess employers, employees, or, or customers suitability towards EV, and then helps them with procuring um, charging infrastructure. Now, I mean, the reason why I'm so excited about Diode, I mean, there are a few reasons, but let me sort of break it down. So firstly, with Diode, I think a lot of investors are overlooking EV, largely because in their mind, it's not a hot market at the moment, right? It's still pretty early, right? Also, people think it's quite early. But what they don't recognize is that EVs are here, it's happening. Just last year, if you look at the Nordics, 75% of all new vehicles purchased were EVs, right? 
and it's exciting because let's take the UK, even considering the pandemic where, you know, the entire car market sort of saw a massive decrease for the first time ever, Europe was the largest EV market across the globe. They were bigger than China, which is insane. Not only that, but you've got a healthy M&A and, and, and exit market. So you've got Podpoint that have been acquired. You've got you've got Green Lots that have been acquired. You've got M&A from BP, Shell, EDF. Those big energy companies are buying companies up. You've got precedence in this market, right? Given the fact that it is so small, you've got so much M&A activity. And I think that's fantastic for Diode because while Diode is early in the market, and we say it's early, but let's say you know, charging infrastructure as a market, it's it's worth more than a billion already, right? So it's it's early, but I mean, it's already a valuable market. But going in this early sort of positions Diode as a, a great strategic acquisition for any big company like EDF or, or, you know, or a BP. Now let's look at the team. So you've got, let's take John, for example. John was ex-head of sales at Podpoint. For those that don't know Podpoint, Podpoint is a just a, a charging infrastructure manufacturer. So if you want to get char a charging kit for your electric vehicle, you'd go to Podpoint. Now, Podpoint were also acquired by EDF. So he knows the market like the back of his hand, but he also has a commercial understanding as well, and he knows how to build up a pipeline. Now, at the point of investing, not giving too much away, I mean, within our pipeline, right, we have more than 50% of the entire vehicle leasing market right, within our pipeline already. So we're having discussions with them, right? So I mean, it, it was a no brainer. The team are really, really impressive. Now in terms of where my value comes in at this stage, I think the team are fantastic. Um, it, it's, it's just random things, it's ad hoc things. Like for example, um, the, the CMO reached out to me today and just asked me for my advice on um, the best customer service or you know, customer success software. So we were looking at Zendesk versus Intercom. And obviously from my, you know, from my experience building the drop and you know, being COO and building out the customer success team, I have experience with Intercom and I was sort of helping him build a comparison table and sharing my advice on which I on which software I think is best. But then also it's about fundraising. So the way I see a CEO's position is you have two responsibilities. Firstly, hire talent. And by the way, Diode have hired their first software engineer, their first you know, talent outside of, outside of the founding team. And then the second thing is fundraising. And part of my role in the last couple of months has been um, understanding when Diode are going to need to raise and then triaging which funds that we think that they should go off and raise from. We'll, of course, look to follow on. But, but also, you know, I, I believe Dio is going to be a massive business. And to be a massive business, you sort of want the right investors on board alongside us that can support us in building out their vision. And the way I see it is you don't go to those investors at the point that you need the cash. You sort of start building that relationship now. And so we've just closed the round, but we've created a list of VCs and potential investors that we think um, can support us in the next round of funding. And I'm getting John and the team to speak to them. And, and that's sort of what my responsibilities are. It's just sort of managing ad hoc and also supporting them with fundraising and, and sort of setting their KPIs, um, helping them with hiring and that sort of stuff. Fantastic. Now, let's just talk about a couple more things. Um, you've been uh, very involved in the, um, the SEIS. Uh, so the first seed EIS that, that Hatch has done sort of today, I think, um, that they've made available to the, the advisor kind of market. Um, how's that gone? Any investments that you can that you've the the the, the um, that's been made already that you can share with us? Sure, <laughs> SEIS one. I mean, it's going really really well. Um, sort of blown away by how much momentum it has at the moment. So, um, I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but I mean, a good chunk of it has has sort of been deployed already. Um, to be honest with you, given that it was only launched two or three months ago. Um, we've announced three deals so far. So Diode was the first one. Betmate was the second. So Betmate is pretty much as a betting platform. But what's exciting about Betmate is that think think uh, think any network that you know any any network that you can think of. Take esports for example. At the moment, you know you sort of play games against friends. Um, 
you've got Twitch as a market where you can watch people play games as well. And you know, Twitch is a massive business. It's the largest video streaming platform across the globe. But what if you can augment the, the interactive interactivity and engagement through allowing players to bet against each other, friends to bet against each other on that same game, right? You, you, you're creating an entirely new market, right? Not only that, but you're also revo you're, you're completely revolutionizing the engagement and the interactivity and the entire experience. And that, that's pretty much what BetMate you're doing. So they're starting off with the Euros, but beyond that, they're looking at different games, different networks, existing proven networks, popular networks, where they can sort of take their technology and improve the peer-to-peer -peer experience through allowing friends to bet against each other. Um, and then the third company is Orbital. Um, and Orbital is a, almost like a, a distance-based audio environment. So at the moment, you know, remote work is ubiquitous. You know, Lawrence, you and I were in different locations and, and organizations are, are going this way as well. But how do you maintain engagement and collaboration in a fully remote you know, workforce? And what Orbital have done is they've created this metaverse, this, this digital you know, replication of an office environment where people can be in their own offices on this platform, right? And instead of having to organize 30 minute Zoom meetings, you can literally just pop into somebody's office. It's, an, it, it's amazing, right? It, it, it sort of takes collaboration back to where it was at pre-COVID, but it probably even accelerates it because now you can integrate with you know, different tools like Miro for whiteboards and Slack for communication and, and all these other different things that are part of the stack. Really brilliant team as well. Ashley, great, great product experience. Tom's also built a VC-backed business before, um, reached Series A and beyond. So he has experience building out a team uh, building out architecture for a fast-growing startup. So those are the first three investments. We've got maybe, I think, seven seven others in the pipeline about that that we've you know, issued term sheets to and that we're excited to work with and sort of going through legals now. So things are going really, really well. The momentum actually is, it's a, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, I mean, we were talking um, about the next fund and, and what comes next and I mean, the opportunities are endless. And I think I'm really excited just from this fund, just to see the, the current cohort of investors, of oh, oh, portfolio companies, sorry, from this first SEIS fund go on to raise much bigger rounds um, from great VCs um, for us to follow on as much as we can as well. Um, and for, for them really to just continue to grow much further than where they are now. Now, uh, we're just kind of coming up to the end. So I'm, I'm going to ask you the, perhaps the most difficult question. If you'd actually managed to save any of that money that uh, you made in the playground rather than sort of uh, <laughs> kind of spending it on clothes, I can't believe you were that uh, sort of uh, <laughs> profligate in your, in your younger age. But uh, if, you, if you had been and you're kind of looking now at what sort of Hatch has currently kind of got out there in the market, the EIS, the CDIS we just talked about, or perhaps the growth fund, where would you be tempted to put a bit of that hard-earned playground cash? Are you talking about like, between the three different funds or are you talking yeah, about... Yeah, I mean, you know, would you spread across all three of them or would you plumb for one of them, particularly based on, you know, how excited you are about some of the, the, the existing companies you've shared with us in the SEIS? It, it's, it's a tough call. I think... The point that I'd make is that I just give the money to Hatch. So whether, whether it's the SEIS or EIS, um, while we've been focused on SEIS, I think we've also made some really, really great EIS investments as well, which we'll announce um, in the next few months. Um, really, I just, I'm not sure if I can say this, um, but yeah, I, I just sort of give it to Hatch, give it to the team and, and we deploy it. But honestly, I think we've got a great portfolio from an SEIS perspective and also an EIS perspective. And I'm excited um, for April to come next year and for us to, to launch another fund, but also just to see what happens with our existing portfolio companies that we've invested in from our SEIS fund and also from our, our latest EIS fund. Well, Jeremy, I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much for sort of sharing, sharing your time uh, so generously today and, and sharing some of the companies as well. Uh, and it looks like uh, I reckon we're, you're going to have to go through this again with me in a few months time. And we can talk about a few more of the businesses that uh, once those term sheets are, are able to become public. But for now, thank you very much for your time.